Good evening, everyone. We're going to have a few more people joining us, but I thought we could go ahead and get started because there's a lot to get to tonight. Um, so first of all, welcome. Good evening. Um, welcome to Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. Uh, my name is Claire Haley. I'm the Vice President of Public Relations and Programs for Atlanta History Center. And it's absolutely my pleasure to welcome all of you out in the audience this evening and our guest tonight, David Hoffman. Um, he will be discussing his new book, which just launched last week. Uh, the title is Give Me Liberty, the true story of Oswaldo Paya and his daring quest for a free Cuba. Um, the cover is beautiful. The book is full of amazing insights about this Cuban freedom fighter. If you haven't yet purchased your copy of the book, um, you can do so from Atlanta History Center's museum shop tonight. There's a link to do that in the chat and your purchase helps support our ability to offer these programs free of charge. And also we'll support David as he makes a run at things like the New York Times bestseller list because our bookstore is an independent bookstore that uh, reports to all of those lists. Um, for tonight only, the book is also 25% off. And even better, if you're in the US, we'll ship it to you. But if you're in Atlanta, feel free to come by and pick it up from our shop. Um, as David and I talk tonight, um, you will have the opportunity to submit your questions. Please do submit your questions. There's always so many good things that come out of our audiences. We use the Q&A to do that rather than the chat. So again, as we talk tonight, if you think of something that you want David to address, please drop it in the Q&A and we will get to as many of those as we possibly can in the time that we have this evening. Let me briefly introduce tonight's guest and I'm gonna turn it over to him to introduce his book and to talk a little bit about how he started this book and why he got interested in the subject. Tonight's guest is David Hoffman. He is an editor and member of the editorial board of the Washington Post. He was previously assistant managing editor, foreign editor, Jerusalem correspondent, Moscow bureau chief, and White House correspondent for that newspaper. If all that wasn't enough, he's also written several books, um, including The Dead Hand, The Untold Story of the Cold War Arms Race and Its Dangerous Legacy, which won the Pulitzer Prize, in addition to several other books, including The Billion Dollar Spy and The Oligarchs. He lives with his wife in Maryland, and we're so thankful that he is joining us to talk about this amazing new release tonight. Welcome, David. Congratulations for having your book out into the world, and we appreciate you coming virtually to Atlanta this evening. Well, thank you, Claire, and thank you to the Atlanta History Center, and thank you to everybody who's come to listen. Um, the great joy of this moment of introducing a book is to find readers, so I hope you'll be uninhibited and pummel me with questions, and I'm flying down to Atlanta right now to get 25% off and pick it up in person. <laughs> the, the book... Uh, came out of a very, some very personal experiences. When I was the Moscow bureau chief of the Washington Post, I read about Andrei Sakharov and read his own memoir. And I actually once visited a house in the woods where he wrote that and thought a lot about what a totalitarian system is like, um, what the Soviet system was like. And when I returned to Washington as foreign editor, I also had a terrible sensation that democracy was on the back foot around the world, that things weren't going very well for the, our hopes that the world would be a more democratic and open place. And um, one day, a, one of my correspondents said, there's this guy in Cuba. Um, he's taking petitions for democracy and asking Fidel Castro, who ruled that Cuba with a, a pretty much an iron hand. He's asking Fidel Castro for democracy. So I sent our reporter to Cuba and he wrote a story about Oswaldo Paya. And I think we all nodded and said, that's amazing. Um, in the back of my mind, I thought this is really more than amazing. And I always had a, a kind of a curiosity about people like this, uh, Natan Sharansky and Sakharov and Vaclav Havel, who was a playwright, you know, uh, Nelson Mandela. What does it really take? Why do people do something like this, risk uh, their families, their lives to demand something like uh, the freedom to speak, to believe, to associate uh, openly and freely? When Oswaldo Paya was killed in July of 2012, I was a just 
arrived on the editorial board of the Washington Post. And I immediately raised my hand and said, I have this thing stuck in the back of my mind about him that it, he did something pretty gutsy. And so I began to write some editorials calling for an investigation of his death, which we never got, but then met his family. And to be honest, I uh, pushed them for many years uh, when they were difficult years for them when they had lost Oswaldo saying I wanted to write a book about him. And um, it took a while, but in 2017, I think they finally uh, came and said, yes, we think it's time to tell the story. And I've been working on it since then. So it's about five year project. And the question that I had from the beginning until tonight is really what inspiration and what determination, what kind of courage does it take to go up against a totalitarian system? Why does somebody do it and, and how do they do it? And I tried for all those five years to answer that question about Oswaldo and I tried to answer it in the book. Well, we'll certainly discuss um, Oswaldo himself, the tactics that he employed and you know what really set him apart from other uh, counter-revolutionary movements, if you will, as they would have been called then. Um, but to put our conversation in context, I wanted to go back a little bit just so we can get kind of on the same playing field as we have this conversation to understand the Cuba into which Oswaldo was born and what he was really up against. Um, so Cuba, of course, was a Spanish colony. Um, it remained a colony longer uh, than some other areas in the Caribbean and Latin America. Um, can you talk about how Cuba won its independence initially and because this will be key in Fidel Castro's um, system later, the role of the United States in that initial Cuban independence movement? The Cuban independence movement actually uh, got started in the 1860s. There was a revolt then and a, and a 10 years war, and it was had a lot to do with uh, revolt against slavery. Slavery was finally outlawed, but independence didn't come with it. The Spanish tried to accommodate some of this unrest in Cuba in the late 1800s, but frankly, the Spanish kept uh, rule of Cuba pretty tough. And the captain general, the, the Spanish uh, rule gave Cubans very little say in their own future, the Spanish controlled politics and the economy. So a new rebellion and really a, a, a revolt began in 1895. And it's uh, quite interesting because a, a large part of the rebel army that fought this war were Afro-Cubans. Uh, and, you know, again, they were fighting for what they hoped would believe become a free and independent uh, Cuba. This was an ideal that was very dear to them. The, the war of the, that had started in 1868 and gone on for years, the failure to accommodate uh, in the latter part of the previous century, everybody was aware that this was not the first time. So that was a really bitter, bitter war. We call it, when the United States entered it, we, we call it the Spanish-American War. But for the Cubans, it was a war for independence. And the Cuban rebel army was outgunned five to one by the Spanish. The, tech, the tactics of the war were horrible. Um, uh, the General Gomez, who led the rebel army, basically decided that he had to burn down Cuba in order to save it because the Spanish, of course, reaped the rewards of Cuba's sugar exports. So a lot of the country, fields were burned, you know, buildings were destroyed. It was a really bitter and difficult war. And when it was over, it, uh, you know, the rebel army won, but that victory was partially because the United States sent forces there and the United States, along with the Cuban rebels, uh, defeated the Spanish. And when the Spanish left and that war was over, you know, the United States had other territories that came into its possession, which were disposed of in various ways. But with Cuba, it was decided basically just to make it a protectorate for a while. And there was basically a military occupation till 1902. And in, in, in a very, I think in some ways, understandable way, but mistaken way, the general who led this thought, well, let's just make Cuba a little bit more like a Ohio. And literally, you know, 
let's bring more schools to Cuba. Well, that was a good impulse. But then he said, let's bring the textbooks from Ohio to Cuba. So there was a big effort, um, some of which was very important for the Cuban people between the independence and 1902 under this U.S. military occupation to improve things. Yellow fever, which was a scourge that had killed many people. Finally, it was figured out that it was caused by mosquitoes. This was a combination of a Cuban doctor's uh, brilliance and the uh, results of the United States that proved that mosquitoes were part of it. And together, yellow fever was reduced. A large number of schools were built. And, and there was a real effort to at least do something in this military occupation. But in 1902, the United States turned over uh, Cuba to its own devices with one big fat exception. Congress passed uh, a law that essentially required the Cubans to agree to let the United States intervene in the event of any uh, concern about uh, health, welfare, and property. And these interventions happened. Um, they happened four times in the next 32 years. Uh, it was called the Platt Amendment. And this particular amendment meant that the shadow of the United States was still long uh, over Cuba. And people who uh, thought that they had fought for independence uh, were in some ways reminded every time the United States sent the Marines that there was going to be a lot of influence from the North. And I think it's very, very important that the Cuban uh, independence thinker, Jose Marti, who was killed in the early part of the war, had often warned uh, of this, that you know somehow Cuba could get swallowed up by the beast from the North. But at the time of independence, Marti was not as widely known. But in the 20s, and especially in the 1930s, a whole generation of young people who had grown up in the new Cuba, in the Re Cuban Republic, were very dissatisfied with what had come as a result of the war. And they rediscovered Jose Marti. They rediscovered him through a biography written by Jose Manach, and who was a Harvard uh, scholar and had gone back to Cuba. And the rediscovery that Marti had also warned of the North led many people to think, you know, we aren't doing it right. We fought this bitter war and we aren't getting where we should be. There was another dictatorship that arose in Cuba in 1933. And then there was a military strongman who ruled uh, for a number of years. And out of that, finally, in 1940, came a real democratic constitution. And I tell the story in the book of the writing of that constitution and its significance, because in that constitution, in addition to separation of powers and democratic systems and the, and the idea of a democracy, there was also a small provision made for citizens to have some input. And it was a reaction to all that had gone before from independence through 1940. And that provision said that 10,000 signatures on a petition could be submitted to the legislature and, and as a request for legislation. That's very important in this story because it's a thread that Oswaldo Payal will later tug on and pull. So the story of the Cuban Republic from independence all the way through really up to 1952 is one of a, a vibrant and serious and urgent struggle for freedom and for democracy. It was, Cuba was a, a middle-class country. It had a, really a very thriving, prosperous uh, economy, as well as a lot of very, very poor peasants. Um, things were distributed poorly in the Cuban Republic. In other words, in the cities, uh, people had good education and they were thriving. And in the countryside, people were just dirt poor and had almost no education. Same with healthcare and the inequities, the seeing the poor peasants was one of the imbalances that uh, brought about Fidel Castro's rise. And I'll stop with that, except to emphasize again that this country had a history called the Cuban Republic from independence until uh, really 1959, but certainly at least until 1952, that was wrapped up in this hope and this dream of 
being free and independent and democratic. And the 1940 Constitution in particular, so, you know, everyone in the audience, hold on to that tidbit about, about the 10,000 signatures, because we'll come back to that a little bit later. But what really struck me about the 1940 Constitution was how progressive it was, you know, not just in the establishment of the system of government, but also in a lot of the goals of the government about the role that it should play in supporting and lifting up the people uh, was just really interesting, like a truly modern document. Um understanding that a lot of those provisions were not implemented, you know, during the forties, there was still problems with corruption and a lot of other issues, but that, that, that seed was there and that desire to move towards that free and open society was very much, you know, written into the DNA of the country as the, the Republic, as it was then founded. Um, but then you have a person who had formerly served in the government who comes back first kind of tries to win the top office legitimately, and then decides when he learns he's not going to win, he's just going to take it over in a coup. Um, so you have Batista who comes you know, back and takes over the government in a coup. And this is what is the impetus for Fidel Castro's rise. So I don't want to get too much into Fidel Castro because he it could be his own lecture series, <laughs> basically to talk about his revolution. Um, but because Oswaldo Paya becomes, you know, the, the public enemy number one of Fidel Castro in a lot of ways. I do think we need to understand um, who was Fidel Castro, you know, how does he come onto the scene? And when he first brings his revolution, you know, down from the mountains, he is talking these very pro-democratic, pro-freedom lines, which I was extremely surprised to reach. So, or to read. So why, what, what happened? Like what changed? Was it Fidel or was it a calculation that he needed the Soviet Union and needed this support to actually be able to make Cuba work the way that he thought that it should? We uh, introduced the idea of this 1940 constitution. One of the things that flowed from it was 12 years of truly constitutional rule. Um, each time in 1940, in 44, in 48, um, power was passed peacefully after an election. And it was experimental. It was a little rocky. It wasn't perfect. But these 12 years of constitutional rule were interrupted then when Batista carried out a coup in March of 1952. And by the way, Oswaldo Paya was about 10 days old when that happened. So, um, Batista was interested in a prospering Cuba and anybody that visited Cuba in the 1950s, especially Havana, would have been struck that it was kind of a center of Latin America. Uh, the, the journal, the magazine Bohemia was widely read throughout Latin America. Uh, television had a real foothold in Cuba that it, they had more radio and television sets than most every place. Cuba was sometimes compared uh, economically to the standard of living of Italy. And, and so this uh, prosperity masked a little bit the fact that Batista also ruled like a mini dictator. He, he was a little tyrant. He would not tolerate dissent. Lots of people were, um, you know, punished, murdered, and tortured. And I think it was in these years, um, seeing uh, this kind of brutality, that Fidel Castro decided to get into politics. And you're right that in this period, you know, he he said that he was interested in basically going back to that wonderful, glowing democracy that he remembered himself and often talked about. And uh, how did Castro go about this campaign? He first he staged a raid on the army barracks. It was a disaster. A lot of his guys were killed. Um, and uh, he was later arrested. He was sent to jail, um, released after two years. He went to Mexico. He plotted a revolt against Batista. He, he sailed back to Cuba on a rickety boat. He hardly made it back. He went into the Sierra Maestra Mountains and tried to essentially organize a guerrilla warfare. So it was with it was a little bit with, you know, violence and coercion. Still in the mountains, he said, I want democracy. I want a beautiful, pure democracy. I want elections. And, and your question is really, why didn't he do any of that? Historians have been asking this question 
for many decades. And I don't have the perfect answer. A lot of the records are still hidden. <coughs> Excuse me. But I think that there is a huge amount of opportunism in Fidel Castro. And the idea that this man in the mountains who was writing manifestos that were printed willingly in Bohemia saying, I want a pure democracy, that he would suddenly within a few years turn to the Soviet Union, embrace Soviet communism, which was a dictatorship, embrace Marx and Lenin. People say, well, gee, was he, was he telling the truth? I mean, did he change? And I think in many ways, he, he was reacting to events and he was an opportunist. I don't see much evidence in anything he said or did in the 50s to suggest that he was a secret communist. I think Raul, his brother, may have been. But I do think that uh, Fidel was in some ways fast on his feet. And when it came time to change, he was there. So, Clary, the question is really important about what follows because he builds a dictatorship in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, and yet it's a very personalized form of leadership. It's very charismatic. It's based on his own interpretation. He does not, I repeat, not uh, build a constitutional democracy. He eviscerates the constitution of 1940, although maybe in a moment of uh, misunderstanding or negligence, he left that little provision in there of the 10,000 signatures, thinking nobody would ever challenge it. But otherwise, he builds one man rule. And a totalitarian system is really one that controls the main pillars of power, right? The economy, mass communications, political power, uh, mobility, the ability to come and go. All of those were part of the Castro system that we saw grow up starting in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was reading this book at you know, the conclusion I drew, which again, historians are, have debated and will continue to, to debate for decades to come as we, you know, learn more and get access to more records was that Fidel Castro, you know, was very much an opportunist, was very much about Fidel Castro, whereas Raul seemed to be more the true believer if there was one, um, which will be significant when we talk about Oswaldo's later years um, in a minute. Well, let's turn to Oswaldo Paya himself, you know, the main subject of your book, um, so where was he born? And was there anything in his family that would suggest that this man was going to go on to become one of the most prominent um, anti-totalitarian activists in Cuban history? Oswaldo was born, as I said, just as Batista took power. And he was almost seven years old when Fidel Castro rolled into Havana and, you know, took power from Batista. And uh, Oswaldo came from a, a large family uh, and they were a strong Catholic family. The family had worshiped in the same parish church for four generations in a neighborhood in Havana. And he had grown up in this neighborhood, El Cerro. Um, Oswaldo Paya was in the whole uh, group of brothers and sisters. He was the rebellious kid. You know, he was the one who always had his fists up, who was always talking back. He was also very well liked by them all, but he was the spark plug in, in the family. And when he was uh, 13 years old, he had a big mop of curly, very jet black hair. He was in the house. Uh, his father had a business. His father's business had been in the 50s delivering newspapers to all the different hotels and kiosks in Havana driving them from the printing press and distributing them. So his father was a man about town. He knew every doorman. He knew every shoeshine boy in Havana. In prosperous Havana, there were a lot of newspapers. It was a, a big media town. Of course, Fidel then began to close and consolidate those, and there was much less. But by 1965, uh, the Payas still had a, a small business. Fidel Castro just did not like the idea of these small businessmen and began uh, to nationalize them. It was a multi-year process that culminated in 68, but Payat was standing in his family's home, which had a room as was a warehouse really for their goods. When the militia came, his father Alejo was taken to jail and their business was confiscated. 
And I think that had a, a huge impact on him because, again, this rebelliousness. A few years later, in 1968, the Soviet uh, Warsaw Pact crushed the Prague Spring. A Waldo Pyle was in high school, and he protested this openly and publicly. A few years after that, he was sent to forced labor camps that Castro had created, and he was sent there because he was uh, rebellious. And also, Catholics were marginalized. In Cuba in this time, they were pushed to the edge of society. They were not given opportunity. And many of them, as well as others like Jehovah's Witnesses, were sent to these forced labor camps. So by the time Oswaldo Paya left the camp in 1972, his rebellious streak had really grown kind of deep. But he didn't know what to do with it. He went to school because he wanted to study physics. And by his own words, he was marginalized at the University of Havana, and uh, teachers would look past him. They wouldn't call on him when he raised his hand. And he finally said, you know, they didn't actually kick me out. They just asphyx asphyxiated me, and I couldn't stay there. So he left the university and tried to get his life together and organize some way to express this sense of dissatisfaction. He studied electronics. He actually got a good, interesting job that he always liked repairing hospital equipment, which was really important in Cuba because it always broke down. But he kept searching for how to bring about change. And this brings us to a long period in the 1980s when Oswaldo Paya thought that the church would actually be at the vanguard of change. When he was a rebellious teenager, there had been a parish priest, Father Alfredo Petit, who encouraged all the young men in the youth group at this uh, parish church to be free thinking, to say what they wanted when they were within the walls of the church. And again, this occurred to Oswaldo Paya that maybe the Catholic church would lead the way for the things he wanted. Later, he formed a, a kind of a club at, at the church devoted to free thinking. People in this parish would gather in the foyer after mass just to talk about things that were going on openly. They talk about a book that had been smuggled in or about a radio broadcast they had heard. So in this environment of the parish church, Oswaldo Paya thought, here is my uh, future. Here is the wedge that we can use. And he published uh, some handbills that were very open in which he spoke about truth and the importance of of openness and democracy. And he became an assistant to the Archbishop of Havana, and he participated in a process of reflection about the church that he hoped would lead to a, a big step forward. And already here he is, he's in his 30s, it's the 1980s, and what happened? The Archbishop refused to move forward with Oswaldo's ideas. The Archbishop was actually trying to organize a rapprochement with Fidel, and Oswaldo was told to stop printing those handbills that were becoming very popular. He, he did stop for a while, and then he started again. Um, he was told that he could not uh, come to an important church conference and make his speech about democracy. He was told to just be quiet. And after all of this had happened through the late 1980s, he finally realized the church was not going to lead the way to his idea of a more open democratic Cuba. And in that time, he met Ophelia, his wife, and they vowed to each other as newlyweds that they would raise their children in an open and free Cuba and never leave. Mm -hmm. But he hadn't figured out how. He really had no idea how. But his experience came from the streets. It came from the parish church. It came from talking to people and not from some textbook that he read. He had some of these textbooks, by the way. He had read Jacques Maritain, the famous Catholic philosopher. He had watched films. Um, he had thought about some of the things, but really his deep inside conviction was organized around a single idea. And his idea was people have rights, basic rights, that are bestowed on them by God and not by Fidel and not by the state. And the people have rights to rights that they should ask for them. You know, it was subversive in Cuba in this time to hang a Merry Christmas sign outside your house or on the church. And he fashioned a Merry Christmas sign out of lights with, so, I think, actually some junkyard parts. And it had flashed in Spanish. And he and his pals 
got a ladder and climbed the church steeple and hung it there in defiance. It was a small thing, but it was exactly went to this idea. We have right to rights and you can't take them away. So that's where we find him in the late 1980s, still searching, having failed with the church to really find an outlet and thinking how to bring about this change. And to put it in context, you know, what he would have been up against at the time, the way the state was structured. I mean, there were secret police, there were security forces, there were forced labor camps for several years, as you mentioned. There were informants, you know, on every street and every organization, there were people who looked like ordinary Cubans who were actually listening to their neighbors and turning them in to the secret police and to the state uh, for things that be, could, could be considered counter-revolutionary. Um, in effect, Castro's government, you know, use that word revolution to characterize the movement that the, he started and that would continue until his death and beyond. You know, they were constantly in a revolution, according to Fidel. And what that meant is that in a revolution, there are enemies and the will of the revolution replaced the will of the people. So you had these tactics learned from the East German secret police, the Stasi that were put into use. You had the Acto de Repudios, which was when mobs would basically be orchestrated by the state to go to houses of people who they deemed were counter-revolutionary and to harass them. So Oswaldo Paya is, you know, growing up and becoming an adult and raising a family in this context of extreme repression. And as you say, at first he tries to go through the church and the church itself makes a decision that they want to try to reconcile with Fidel so they, and according to them, they don't cease to exist. So it's a very interesting, you know, argument there. But you know, you mentioned how Paya, okay, he says, I can't go through the church. What does he do next? How does he first get turned on to this idea that a petition could actually be the way um, to bring something to the attention of the Cuban people? So, uh, you know, this charismatic rule by Fidel in the 1960s was based on something that Castro called direct democracy. Um, he never had the elections that he promised, and he cut up the Constitution so that only he would be in charge. But he said, my democracy is in the square. I'm, when I call a million people out, I, you know, I'm the maestro. And when I say, do you support me? And they all cheer. That's th democracy. That's all I need. But Oswaldo saw the fiction there that because the, there was no real mechanism. And he began to think about what would be a way to cause change in a society where he had no access to the press, mass communications. Oswaldo Paya could not speak his mind on radio. He could not talk about it on television. You know, you were essentially suffocated in, in this environment and also because he was Catholic. Um, that was another mark that made it very, very difficult for him to think about how to challenge the system. But as the Soviet Union basically collapsed in 1991, a huge amount of economic aid to Cuba stopped. People got hungry and people got mad. And this opened a new time for us, Waldo, starting really in the late 80s and the early 90s. There were other people who actually had started to become opposition and dissidents to Castro, not only Paya. One of them was a fellow named Ricardo Bofield. And Ricardo Bofield decided to form a new political party. And he said, I'm going to collect signatures because that provision of the 1940 Constitution had never been deleted. It was still in the Constitution, even one that Fidel had revised. He just, I think, never thought anybody would dare do it. Well, Bofield collected some hundreds of signatures until one day Fidel Castro said enough and uh, Bofield left the country never to return. Um, there is another example of a man named Andres Solaris, who was a civil engineer who was very dissatisfied and was thinking about how to cause change and was going to collect signatures. And, you know, those informants you mentioned, somebody informed on Andres before he had he had printed up the pages for, to collect them. He hadn't collected a single signature. The secret police knocked on his door and hauled him off to prison for six years. That that kind of prelude didn't really create much optimism for Oswaldo Paya that collecting signatures would be a good idea. 
But Oswaldo reached a kind of a moment of, of insight that others hadn't, which is collecting signatures for change was legal. It was written in the Constitution. And if he was going to bring about some kind of real uh, challenge to Castro, his idea was use the laws of the state against itself. Use that provision as a lever to get change. And if you could tell people this is legal, it's in our Constitution, it would help them conquer their fear. And as you say, fear was a very big factor. And Cuba was a police state, and it was rigidly enforced. And believe me, this insight that Oswaldo had, which he begins to act on in 1990-91, did not go very well at first. There was a mob attack on his house where he was collecting signatures mm -hmm. inspired by the state. Um, it wasn't clear. He was very vague about what he wanted with the signatures. He admired Lech Walesa, the Polish president. And if you recall, in Poland, communism kind of was eased out with something called the round table. It all seemed very sort of uh, a process that was, uh, you know, it was slow. It took years, but the Polish roundtable didn't turn into Tiananmen Square. Oswaldo Pyle was frightened and worried about what had happened in Tiananmen Square, the violence with which China had repressed the democracy movement. And he wondered, was he sort of caught between Lech Valenza and the roundtable, which appealed to him, and China and the bloody crackdown of Tiananmen? Which way would it go? Oswaldo did not want to have Cubans killed. He said, we can't ask for liberation and with bloodshed. It does, it's not what I wanted. So frankly, the early efforts to collect signatures and cause change, it had a brilliant idea that you could use the state against itself, but he wasn't really sure what he was asking for. It was vague. And for that reason, it, there were not a lot of people who would go along. So he takes learnings from this first effort, which, as you say, ended in failure, but not his arrest, which was the case in some other instances. So he, you know, kind of lives to fight another day, to, so to speak. He comes back with something that he ends up calling the Varela Project, um, which is probably his most famous contribution um, to the Cuban liberation movement. And it is a one page, extremely clear, concise petition that he learned from his earlier mistake of being too verbose as he was sometimes given to do. In short, like he, asked, yeah. he asked for freedom of association, expression, and press, amnesty for political prisoners, the right to form private companies, the right to free elections, and that new elections would be held nine months after the adoption of the petition. So where does this document come from and what are the early days of petitioning for signatures like? Is it received warmly by people in Havana where he was located or did it take some time to build up momentum? It took four years and uh, right around the time he was starting it, by the mid 90s, you know, Cubans were really in desperate straits. The economy had collapsed. Uh, people had gone to eating bark and grass and, you know, it was a very, very difficult time and made them more open to this idea of change. It was also true that Oswaldo's uh, discussion that this was legal had an effect on people. You know, it really did. People started to sign and they gave their addresses and they gave their national identity numbers so they could be tracked. And they really stood up to be counted. But the biggest thing that happened was the Pope. Pope John Paul came to Cuba and in one of his uh, appearances said, you have to be the protagonist of your own future. You can't just be spectators. And this crystallized everything that Paya believed. And he really put on then a big movement to collect the signatures. And by 2002, he had collected more than the 10,000 necessary on the Varela Project petitions in May of 2002, just before Jimmy Carter's visit to Cuba, which was another important event. Oswaldo Payan and his associates brought a box with 11,020 signatures 
demanding democracy and submitted it to the National Assembly. It was unheard of and unprecedented. And this was the thing that caught my attention many thousands of miles away. It's just, it's incredible because I think sometimes living in the U.S., for us, petitions are almost cheap sometimes in a way, right? Like someone can just go on change.org and make a petition. Yeah, it's the guy on the street that says, hey, would you sign? Exactly. This was different. People were challenging the system. Mm -hmm. But Claire, I wonder if we should now just take some questions from the audience. I don't want to to, uh, monopolize anymore and we can continue. Absolutely. Uh, And there are several in the Q&A, but if you've been thinking of your question, it hasn't made it into the Q&A yet, please feel free to drop it in there. So let's start with this one from a member of the audience. Um, talking about uh, broader, the relationship between U.S., Cuba, and the USSR. Um, so do you think that the U.S. boycotting Cuba under Castro um, drove Castro kind of into the arms of the USSR? So how did you see that working? If you look at the events of 1960-61, it was a mutual driving. Yes, the events, the things, decisions taken by the United States uh, may have driven him, but also Castro w- drove the United States out of Cuba. And the two things together happened real, relatively fast. The United States imposed a trade embargo that is still in effect today. And to be honest, people ask about this all the time as if we have some magic power over Cuba. But Oswaldo would say, and I think there's some wisdom in this, um, lifting the trade embargo against Cuba is not going to bring democracy to Cuba. And keeping the trade embargo is not bringing democracy to Cuba. The issue is not the trade embargo. The thing is this, it's up to Cubans themselves to bring about democracy. And it's up to them largely from within to do it. So we should stop Americanizing the idea that the future of Cuba is in our hands. It's in their hands. Mm -hmm. And that was such a driving force behind Oswaldo's decision to stay in Cuba, right? And to fight there instead of becoming an expat like some other folks chose to do. Um, and, his- and the exile community is very big mm-hmm. and it's filled with people that had these democratic ideals mm-hmm. who were either forced out or, or fled. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the thing is, it's very, very true that the Cuban community includes them. Mm-hmm but it also includes 11 million Cubans. And they're split by these 90 miles of the Florida Strait, but actually it's gonna require everybody. It's gonna require the round table idea ultimately to get to a transition. Mm-hmm. Again, if you have uh, more questions for David, please drop those in the Q&A. So moving on to the next one from an audience member. Um, can you contextualize a little more uh, when you're talking about how Batista Cuba was doing quite well. Um, How does that take into consideration the difficult conditions of, as you mentioned, the people in the countryside? So can you talk a little more about the division there? Yes, uh, for example, literacy in the Cuban countryside was extremely low and literacy in the cities was very high. Um, Healthcare in the countryside was extremely low and healthcare in in the cities was was good. And uh, all the trappings of this prosperity were centered in Havana, uh, especially. And of course, in the 50s, it was a very glamorous time when these big casinos were being run by the mob. Uh, There was a lot of money sloshing around and evident wealth, but uh, it didn't actually help those large numbers of people in the countryside. And remember that sugar, dominated this economy. It had for most of the century. And at one time, Cuba produced a quarter of the world's sugar. And even in the 50s, it produced a lot of of sugar. And Batista had actually tried and thought about trying to diversify that. He he tried to borrow money to start other businesses. But to be honest, uh, Cuba was still basically hooked on sugar. So it was an imbalanced a, a vessel, you know, it was always listing and it was the cities and the government. Um, there was evidence of lots of vibrancy and prosperity. I'm particularly impressed by the television stations. They ran lots of ads for American pr- household products. But if you went deep into the Cuban countryside, the people that cut the sugar and the people that, you know, were far away, they never saw or heard of it. The, they lived on another planet. Fidel Castro saw this. 
and he especially understood the plight of the world Cuba, and he was a social reformer at heart. We talked, he talked about Marxism and Leninism and Soviet communism, but really Fidel wanted to equalize that really unequal situation. And that would require taking down a notch, the elites in Havana, and trying to elevate the poor in the countryside, and he did. Uh, this question from the audience, can you talk about how Oswaldo dealt with the secret police? This is a subject that's detailed qu quite at length in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, Swaldo was, first of all, I think he was basically a fearless individual, but he had a family. He worried about the family. As time went by, there began to be threats against his family. Um, he and Ophelia decided at one point that dangers were growing for their children. But he also told people constantly, don't be afraid. What we're doing is legal. He, though, didn't stand on street corners to do that. He had to meet people privately in their homes. You know, they had to close the door. Sometimes the secret police would get to a village or a town ahead of him, and, and people were so scared they wouldn't meet, and he'd have to rejigger it and come back another time. Um, he organized a people across the island to help collect signatures, again, not with uh, flags flying and banners, but quietly going door to door. Do you have a friend? Is there somebody else in your parish? And it was, I wouldn't say it was clandestine because they weren't secretive about what they were doing, but the tactics were very much to create cells and to move quietly. And if you look at it in the end, when they had those 11,020 signatures in May of 2002, um, if Fidel and his secret police were so smart, if they had known about it, they might have stopped it, but those signatures were submitted. Oswaldo submitted them and got a stamp, signed, sealed, and delivered. It was a shock. Fidel thought maybe he had a few hundred signatures or maybe a thousand, and then he shows up with 11,000. It's incredible. Um, how many did he gather uh, by the end of the project? So the first submission was 11,020. The second submission was more than 14,000. So we're getting up now to 25,000. There was another 10,000 in hiding. And Oswaldo used a network of nuns that he was familiar with. And they hid the signatures in convents because that was a place they thought the secret police wouldn't find them. And this was a highly secretive and effective way to protect them. So in the end, I think 35,000 or more people uh, joined Oswaldo and signed the Varela project. Mm -hmm. In the end, uh, Fidel Castro took them and threw them in the trash can. Mm -hmm. um, I have one audience question I'm going to save till the end because it's the perfect question to end on. So if you have questions in the audience, please drop them in the Q&A um, and we will get to those. But I, I wanted to run, um, I was watching some interviews with Oswaldo Paya and there's one quote that really stuck with me. He said, I have discovered the profound feeling of liberation, which does not mean that I am not afraid, but that I'm not ruled by fear or hate. Can you talk about his commitment to non-hatred and revolution and how sometimes his willingness to work um, within the regime's parameters was controversial amongst people who thought maybe he should take a different approach? Yes, Oswaldo, uh... And this idea of collecting signatures in a legal bid for change, I think, was uh, really representative of the kind of change Cuba needed from the streets. But in Miami, the exile community didn't really pay much attention to him. They didn't understand it. Um, the, uh, some critics there said, oh, these little baby steps are steps of accommodation to Fidel. They couldn't have been more wrong. Actually, Fidel uh, wasn't really noticing that a guy was collecting signatures for a democratic Cuba. It was quite a radical thing he was doing. He wasn't an accommodation at all, but he did not uh, have a relationship with the exile community in Miami. And in some ways he was misunderstood by them. I think that his uh, hope was that people would conquer their fears enough to be able to stand up and say, I'm for this. And he oftentimes uh, held his hand in an L for liberation with his thumb like this. Uh, this idea of liberation, he once wanted just to call his party liberation because it was like solidarity as a single word. But it really stuck with him that this whole hope 
to give people their basic rights could be brought about peacefully. And he did not uh, in any way countenance coercion, um, violence. And believe me, through the whole period of history we've been talking about, many people did. And, you know, there were many violent movements, not to mention the Bay of Pigs invasion. Mm -hmm. um, this was not Oswaldo's world. He felt that you could not kill ideas. And he was, this was an idea that he was championing. Another question from the audience, uh, just getting at what we touched on a little bit earlier, but I want to take it through beyond just Fidel's coming to power and his, you know, shredding of the constitution, but kind of through his rule. Do you, have you found in your research that Fidel Castro became even more anti-democratic as his rule went on, even after the collapse of the Soviet Union? I think that Fidel's movement uh, to become anti-democratic was very early. Mm -hmm. He had promised democracy when he was a guerrilla in the mountains. By 1962-63, he was set on, a, on this direction. And uh, certainly at the time of the Prague Spring, there was hesitation. If you recall, the Prague Spring was about a liberal kind of socialism. And the, it was crushed by the Warsaw Pact. Fidel hesitated because look, here was a small country being crushed by this big one. And Cuba was a small country and Fidel was silent for three days. Nobody knew exactly. And eventually he came out and said, well, I understand the Soviet Union had to save socialism. So it was fine to crush the Prague Spring, but Oswaldo didn't think so. And I think that this whole idea that he had about rights and fighting for them was the exact opposite of Fidel's notion that he alone had built a revolution. Everybody was for him. If you were against him, goodbye. Uh, you know, there were a number of major um, departures from Cuba, thousands of people leaving on boats, Mariel, the Balseros exodus. And I think it's really important that this discussion we're having is not only about history. Last year in July, there was a huge outpouring, a spontaneous outpouring. A hundred or thousand Cubans took to the streets. And what were they shouting? Libertad. And what were they doing with their hands? They were doing this. So I think the idea that Oswaldo had, that if you get people to conquer their fear, um, they, this is what they wanted, is still alive today. And his lessons about how to go after it which are to persevere, to understand that an idea can't be put in a jail cell, are, is still really important. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. brings me to the last audience question we have, which I've been saving because it's the perfect one to end on. Um, so this audience member uh, says that she read that in 2005, there were multiple groups in Cuba that supported democracy. Um, one that she calls out that you describe in the book, the ladies in white. Um, the statement to, quote, let Cubans define democracy for themselves rings true. So what about the status of Cuban government governance today? Where are we almost exactly 10 years after Oswaldo Payaz's death? So I remind you that in 2002, Oswaldo submitted the signatures. In 2002, he was awarded the Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought, really the most important prize for human rights activism in the world. In 2003, Fidel had had enough. He arrested a lot of Oswaldo's assistants and associates. 75 people were given long jail sentences, some of them more than 20 years, for collecting signatures. Oswaldo was not arrested because he was very prominent at the time, but he was tormented. And for a decade, he, he was just absolutely torn up seeing his friends in prison. Many of them served at least seven years. And he was still campaigning at the time in 2012 when he was killed. The Ladies in White was formed by the wives of those men who were taken in prison in 2003. They also were courageous. They dressed in white and went out every Sunday on the streets to remind Cubans that it wasn't over, that there was still this spirit. So I, I think your, your questioner is right to ask about it, but the, the, the government hasn't changed. The government of Cuba today is the same one with the same provisions and ideals that Fidel Castro put in place. And the spirit of rebellion is also alive 
because Cuba is going through a terrible economic period now. There's hunger again. There are long lines for food. There are shortages everywhere. And I feel that the environment hasn't changed all that much. And the conditions that Oswaldo saw um, that prompted him to go door to door like that are still there. Your book comes out during a time where we hear a lot of reports about rising authoritarian or totalitarian tendencies um, in various parts of the world. Uh, what do you think the lessons that Oswaldo Payan, his movement or his movimiento can uh, give to people who are wondering or worried about democracy today? I think people are still waking up to the fact that democracy is going dark in a large parts of the world. It's very, very worrisome to me. Uh, I have friends in Belarus, you know, they had a democratic election in August of 2020. It was just stolen right out from under them. The dictator said, I'm staying, goodbye. And in Ukraine, we see this terrible war is really about whether or not a dictator has the right to take over your country. And I don't know if people are paying attention to Myanmar, where there was a legitimate election and Aung San Suu Kyi, who was a icon of democracy and a Nobel Peace Prize winner has been thrown into prison and the military junta is shoot to kill orders for people protesting, not to mention Russia, where a democratic movement has been destroyed. China um, had something of an opening in the 90s, but it also, under Xi Jinping, has turned into a very, very hostile space. So in a world where from Russia to China and a lot of places in between, including Cuba, democracy is going dark, that should worry us because this is about our values and preserving things that we care deeply about that our republic is based on. Well, thank you, David, so much for your time tonight. Thank you to everyone. I wish I could be happier in concluding, <laughs> but well, it's not happy. But you know what I will say that, you know, maybe isn't happy, but it's just, just inspiring is that, you know, this is one person who wasn't particular, you know, who wasn't born into enormous wealth or privilege, who wasn't, you know, necessarily any more special than anyone else, but was able to catalyze thousands of people into concrete action, you know, with their names, with their identification numbers. And, you know, reading this book really showed me the power of, you know, one person and with an idea, as you say, that can't be necessarily put in the jail cell. So um, maybe there's some, you know, solace and inspiration in that moving forward. I hope so. I hope so too. But David, thank you so much. This has been just fascinating. The fastest hour of my week. I wish that we had more time, but to everyone in the audience, if tonight's conversation was at all interesting to you, there's so much rich detail that we just didn't have the time to get into. I highly encourage, encourage you to get the book, to read it. Um, my colleague Monique put some great links in the chat. I'll also follow up with via email. Um, where David has made available some of the original sources that he relies on heavily in the book if you're interested in reading it. And if you want to hear uh, more about the book, David, could you talk about your upcoming appearance on July 14th uh, that will be uh, recorded if people- I will be uh, speaking at the National Endowment for Democracy mm -hmm. on July 14th. I think it will be streamed and also recorded and played back. And I'll be joined by Oswaldo's daughter, Rosa Maria Paya who now leads a, a movement called uh, Cuba de Cide uh, for Cuban democracy and independence, championing the idea, ideals and ideas of her father. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So that again is on July 14th. Um, I know I will be tuning in or watching a recording afterwards. Um, but again, if you enjoyed tonight's conversation, uh, we're going into a little bit of a respite as a uh, Publishing gets a little slow in July and August, but we'll be back in the fall with a lot of new books and a lot of new virtual and in-person author talks. Um, again, thank you, David, so much for your time. Thank you to everyone in the audience, and I hope everyone has a safe and wonderful evening. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, readers. Thanks.